Well, welcome everybody. This is our third day of the Horse Management Seminar webinar series for 2024. Thank everybody for being in attendance. We have a couple of things to do before I introduce our speakers and get started. Um, so I am Dr. Carrie Williams. I'm the Equine Extension Specialist at Rutgers University. So what that means is I bring you education, um, whether it's me educating or others educating you. Um, that is my job is to be the liaison between our university and the horse owning public. So welcome and thank you for joining us. So let me also introduce the Equine Science Center. I'm gonna share my screen and show you a little bit of a video so you understand a little bit more about what the Equine Science Center does. Good morning. Welcome to the George H. Cook campus, home of the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, and of course, home to the Rutgers Equine Science Center. The Equine Science Center is a soft walled center where we bring together the best and the brightest to solve challenges impacting horses, horse well being, and the horse industry. To provide you more details about the research being conducted at the Equine Science Center and specifically the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kenneth McKeever. The lab was founded in 1995 and since then it's been one of the most productive um, research labs in the country, if not the world. We've conducted studies looking at how to care for the aged horse, that's a horse that's over 20. We've looked at various drugs that affect performance. We've even done studies for the Army looking at food extracts that can reduce inflammation. So the Equine Science Center and the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab are a valuable asset to how we care for horses in the state of New Jersey. So we've all visited this morning the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab, part of the Equine Science Center at Rutgers. We have another facility where cutting edge research is being carried out, located on Riders Lane, and it is the site of the first of its kind, environmental best management practices demonstration horse farm, located here on the George H. Cook campus. The team of scientists who are helping horse farmers become better environmental stewards and caretakers of the land is a team of multidisciplinary faculty, students, and staff, led by Dr. Carrie Williams, Dr. Mike Westendorf, PhD student Jennifer Weinart, and other faculty, students, and staff from different departments here at Rutgers and beyond. Hello, I'm Dr. Carrie Williams, the Equine Extension Specialist here at Rutgers University and the Associate Director of Extension for the Equine Science Center. We are here at the Environmental Best Management Practice Demonstration Horse Farm. This serves as a wonderful venue for the public, farm owners, other industry professionals to come look and see the eight various best management practices, educational venues that they can use on their farm or in their areas. It is open to the public. You can come anytime. This venue also serves as a great location for research. My current graduate student, Jennifer Weinart, is looking at both cool season and some novel warm season grasses to see the production as well as the horse's metabolism. Some glucose and insulin responses as well as the microbiome will be looked at over the next two years of this project. Thank you for visiting all of us at the Equine Science Center. Our website can be found at ESC rutgers.edu and with that i just want to share a couple of the funded projects that the equine science center um, is looking into this year um, you can read about uh, pharmacokinetics and di uh, dynamics of SARMs as well as uh, validation of some muscle atrophy scoring um, the Equine Science Center is really uh, one of our top centers in the country for research. So we encourage you, if you like anything you've heard tonight, or if you're interested in giving back to the horse and donating for some of the research projects, you can visit our website at esc.ruckers.edu 
and go to our donate page. So with that being said, I'm gonna give a few more details and then I also really wanna to get to know you as attendees. So first off, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping items. Um, I wanna let everybody know that if you're having any technical difficulties, okay, so anything with the webinar itself, please go ahead and use the chat. The chat only comes to us as panelists and I have Kyle Hartman behind the scenes of the uh, Rutgers Equine Science Center helping me with all IT issues, and he should be able to help uh, answer any of those. But if you are going to ask our speakers any questions throughout the evening, um, please use the Q&A box, and those are all found at the bottom. If you look in the bottom of your screen and hover your mouse over it, you have the Q&A and the chat boxes. None of us are able to hear you. Um, we have all of your microphones turned off or in, are enabled. So please feel free to, um, you know, not worry about your barking dog or make dinner, um, have a conversation. Um, we can't hear you, it's okay. Um, the only way you can communicate with us, like I mentioned, is through the chat um, or ask questions from the speakers in the Q&A box. For any of you who have missed our previous two episodes, we had um, pasture management on February 13th. Uh, we had uh, senior horse care on February 20th. And then today um, we have been recording them and they will be posted on the Equine Science Center's YouTube page. And they will be, uh, we, you will get an email since you are all here and registered, you'll get an email stating when they've been posted. It'll take us about a month uh, to get everything edited and posted. So you'll be hearing from us then. So with that being said, I'm gonna share my screen one more time, but before I do that, I'm gonna ask everybody to go to, on a different browser, their phone or wherever, you're gonna to go to a website called Menti. And I even want you to do this if this is your third webinar and you've done it every time because it looks different every day. So please go to Menti and then it's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And once you're there, it's gonna ask you for an eight digit number. And I am going to share my screen and then I'll provide you with that number. Um, and it's gonna ask you some questions. Very important though, before I open it up, the first question is gonna ask you what state or country you are in. Please do not abbreviate. The reason for not abbreviating is because I wanna make sure that everybody's answers come in looking the same way. So again, that number is 9411. 8738 and Kyle also put it in the chat. So 9411-8738 and that will take you, um, so join at menti.com and you can do it on your phone, it's pretty easy. So this is only gonna allow you one response, so don't abbreviate. Tell me what state or country you are listening to this webinar from. And the reason why I say don't abbreviate is because the more people answer New Jersey or Pennsylvania, uh, the words are, and the letters are going to get bigger. Um, so uh, if you abbreviated New Jersey, it's not going to count you in the big word New Jersey. So I love watching this. I love watching things change. And I also, over the last three webinars, love to see if we have any new states or countries that log on. And right now, um, it's, it's hard to read because they're all changing, but I see Canada and Brazil are some of our uh, international folks. Who else do I see? I see a lot of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and that's about right because obviously uh, Rutgers is in New Jersey and one of our speakers is in Pennsylvania. So that makes sense to me. Um, I'm not seeing too many of our international. Oh, we do have UK, United Kingdom. Welcome, thank you. Um, like I mentioned, Brazil and Canada. A um, couple webinars we had, some from Russia. I'm not seeing Russia on there today. Um, so I'm gonna leave this up for just a little bit. I see we have 95 people that have logged on to Menti. So I'm gonna leave this up for just a little bit because again, I love watching how everything changes and moves around. So again, Menti is M-E-N-T-I. And then the code, the code is 9411-8738. And you can still do so. You can come on at any time. It'll just keep changing as you enter your answer. So again, we still have out of the country, we've got Brazil, the United Kingdom. Oh, we have our Alaska back. Thank you, Alaska. I know uh, you were new this year. So awesome. Thank you. Or at least I didn't get to see it. Um, Ontario. Thank you. We have an Ontario and a Canada. So uh, we got 
some more Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania and New Jersey are still holding strong. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the next one because the next one tells me a little bit about what you are involved with in the horse industry. And I asked for what's your primary interaction. Granted, I give you three responses because if you're a horse trainer but also own your own horse and obviously an enthusiast because otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? Um, you can pick that too. Or if you're a veterinarian but you're also uh, you know, horse owner, et cetera. If you do choose other, what I want to know, and go ahead and put it in the chat box. Don't put in the questions, please. Put this in the chat box. Tell me what you mean by other. I know in the past we've had a couple that are either, um, you know, uh, equine therapy or path instructors. I've had some um, massage therapists, things like that. So go ahead and tell me what you mean by other, because right now we have 19 other, and I'm really curious. Um, we got five veterinarians. Great. I think that's actually the highest number of vets we've had. Um, industry professionals. So we're talking about feed, tech, and pharma. Lots of barn managers and trainers, but obviously lots of horse owners. So that's great. So in the other, we've got an equine assisted meditation teacher. Awesome. Path instructor. Equestrian events organizer. Great. A vet technician. Uh, college professor. Welcome. Um, EGALA or, uh, yeah, EGALA certified instructor, uh, licensed vet technician. So a lot of vet technicians, a lot of PATH certified instructors. Maybe in the future, what I'll do is I'll make this, um, if it lets me have a few other bars, I'll at least make one for a therapeutic riding instructor. So that always seems to be high on the list. Um, and kind of vet tech is always up there as well. So it always gives me, uh, uh, something to add to the list. So. So I will leave this up for just a little bit longer, but thank you. I always love to know where everybody comes from. I am going to go back. Let's see if there's more. Nope, still 104 uh, answered the states, but um, looks like that's pretty, pretty solid. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop that and stop sharing my screen. I always find that a lot of fun, uh, fun to do. So with that being said, that's pretty much everything that I need to tell you other than uh, introduce our first speaker of the day. So I'm going to ask, yeah, Dr. Smarsh can come on and uh, can pull up your seminar. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to have two uh, friends and colleagues of mine on today's webinar. Uh, Danielle Smarsh, uh, and I, I shouldn't be hesitating in her bio, but I always try to wonder where to start. Um, she was actually my graduate student not all that long ago, so I should be able to do this bio with my eyes closed and not read it, but just so I don't miss anything, I will read it. Um, Dr. Danielle Smarsh is an assistant professor um, of the equine science and equine extension specialist in the Department of Animal Science at Penn State. She moved back to the Northeast after spending four and a half years teaching in the animal science department at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. She is a, was a New Jersey native. She grew up in Hunterdon County. She received her bachelor's in animal science from the University of Delaware. And then she came to me um, as, uh, her P as a PhD candidate in equine exercise physiology. Um, her research looked at the effects of age and training on antioxidants and oxidative stress in standard breads. However, currently at Penn State, she researches projects on the understanding uh, uh, that involve understanding of Pennsylvania's horse industry and looking at the effects of diet and exercise on GI health. Um, she also teaches a bunch of undergraduate classes um, and has a lot of extension programs. One of those involves dealing a lot with parasites and ticks. And that is why I gave her the really tough job of combining parasites and ticks into one 50 minute lecture and still allowing enough time for us to answer her questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Smarsh. Um, again, please feel free to ans ask any questions you have of our speaker in the Q&A box and we will have time when she's done talking for any questions. Thank you, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Williams for that great introduction. It's lovely to be speaking for Rutgers again. And yes, I, I am going to fly through slides because this is a lot to cover, just touching the surface here. Uh, so bear with me. Um, just a quick uh, disclaimer here. I, as Terry just said, I have my PhD. I'm not a veterinarian. So this is all for uh, educational purposes, what I'm going to present here. We always suggest that you seek the advice of your veterinarian when dealing with any specific health issues with your horse. 
I want to review first just some brief terminology and the life cycle of parasites as we talk about them through the next 45 minutes or so. So a parasite is considered a small organism that's going to live on or in and at the expense of a host. All right. And we can think about this and subdivide in a couple different ways. One is to think about, are we dealing with ectoparasites or endoparasites? So examples of ectoparasites would be like mosquitoes and ticks. They pretty much live on the outer surface of the animal. Endoparasites would be things like the strong giles, ascarids, roundworms, et cetera, um, that are going to spend part of their life cycle somewhere inside the animal. Additionally, these parasites may or may not be species specific. So again, coming back to the mosquitoes and ticks, um, the same mosquito that bit your horse can bite you, same with the tick. Um, they don't really, they have certain species they prefer, but they can um, eat from multiple species. Others, uh, again, so I'll think of strong giles, uh, some of our internal parasites. Um, there are specific types of worms inside your horse that are slightly different species than the ones you might find in your cattle or your dogs or in humans. Um, so we can use this knowledge to our advantage when thinking about management, which is really what I'm going to be focusing on here. We'll talk a little bit about the health effects from these different parasites, but more so thinking about how we manage and control these parasites. And for both the worms I'll be talking about and the ticks, I will be showing some pictures of life cycles like this one here on the right. And so these life cycles all have these lovely little diagrams here and they usually involve stages again within or on the animal if we're thinking uh, of our ectoparasites and then there are stages that are going to be outside of the animal somewhere in the environment and the general stages of life that we'll see on these diagrams they usually start off as eggs and then we will have some level of larval development. We may have a nymphal stage as well. And I starred larva and nymph because depending on the parasite, you might not have a nymph stage. You might just go from larval straight to the final stage, which is adult. Um, one other comment on the larval stage, you might also see several subsets. So like L1, L2, L3. Um, and again, those are just, if we got into the nuances, there, slightly different things will happen in terms of development in each of those stages. So I'm going to start with parasitic worms first. And there are lots of parasitic worms that are common in horses. I just have a short list here. As Carrie said, uh, Penn State Extension, we have a number of parasite workshops. We have an online course on this. We have articles. Uh, it's kind of one of our core areas we like to talk about. And so tonight, I decided with the time that I was given to focus just on the small strong giles with the red star I put near them. But you may have heard of some of these others like large strong giles uh, or ascarids, which we see here in this petri dish, um, stomach bots, we've got pinworms, we've got tapeworms. So there are certainly many parasites we can talk about in terms of control, but again, for time and also because of the prevalence of small strong giles, I'm going to focus on them. So we consider strong giles our number one problem for worms for adult horses. And I stress adult because if you're looking at our weanlings and younger horses, we'd have to worry about things like ascarids. So what is happening with these um, strong giles? Well, the larvae is going to be out in the environment, and I'll show you a life cycle diagram in just a second. But the horse is going to consume the larvae as they graze. So this top picture shows a little bundle of the larvae, and they basically swim up blades of grass. And once the horse consumes this larva, so it, it's, it is accidental on the part of the horse, they're not intending to adjust it, but the environment where they're in, they sort of an accidentally do this. The larva will be uh, swallowed with the grass into the stomach of the horse. And then uh, the, the, these strong giles, the small strong giles, like to hang out in the uh, intestine, the large intestine of the horse. Now, there are two subsets of strong giles, the large and the small. Uh, the large strong giles on the horse, there's only a couple species found in horses. They are considered highly pathogenic, meaning they cause disease. Um, they cause some quite nasty hemorrhaging because they like to migrate through the cranial mesenteric artery and through the blood vessels. Um, nowadays, not so much a problem. We consider large strong giles fairly under control. It is the small strong giles that are the, the big problem here. Um, there are probably over, close to 50 different species that can live in horses. They're not as pathogenic as the large strong giles are, so they're not going to migrate through the arteries and cause mass hemorrhaging and, and death. Um, there can be some other health things that go on. Other key thing with small strong giles, ubiquitous, meaning they're pretty well established in horses. We're never going to fully get rid of the strong giles um, in your horse. 
And also problematic is that they are developing resistant to our dewormers. If you've ever done a fecal egg count, uh, we are looking for eggs of the strong gyles, and this is a nice example. Um, this horse, I would guess, would be probably a high shedder just on how many eggs in this picture alone, but this is the pretty classic example of what a strong gyle egg is going to look like. So here's your life cycle circle here. So again, there we will start off as eggs that are in the manure that the horse has passed out into the pasture. On the pasture, these eggs will develop and they do have subset stages of the larval stage. So we go from L1, L2, and then L3. It's the L3 that will climb up the little blades of grass. The horse will eat that. And then the larvae will be in the gastrointestinal tract of the horse. And once they're in the intestines, um, there is a possibility, and we'll talk more about this on the next slide, that the larvae can actually burrow into the intestinal wall. Um, so we think a lot about parasites from our side, but sometimes we need to think about it from the parasite's point of view. They are trying to survive um, and reproduce and continue on their species, and they're doing a pretty good job so far. So they have some tricks up their sleeves to survive our various uh, management practices. So this is one trick that I have. Eventually, we need to get to an L4 larval stage to then mature into adults. They will lay eggs and the cycle continues. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. So let's talk about this burrowing into the wall of the intestine. Um, so the strong gyle larva, one of their tricks up their sleeve, they can enter arrested development. The fancy thing we can say that they're doing is that they can insist in the gut mucosa. So again, they're burrowing into the wall. So this is a, a picture of intestine with all those little red dots which show where our parasites have burrowed in. And we don't know how long they can for sure like max out um, with what little research and, and knowledge that we have. We know they can survive for at least two years burrowed in the wall of the intestine, which is really impressive in my mind. Um, I have a picture of the GI tract of a horse here on the bottom right, just to remind you. Um, so the stomach, small intestine, here's our cecum. And then I, we're talking about the intestine back here where we could often find them. So they'll be in the walls and they'll survive until and stay in those walls until they decide that the lumen of the gut, the hollowed area, is ideal for them to come back out. And the other tricky thing about these insisted larvae is that they're not always exposed to dewormer treatments. You might see some boxes sometimes now specifically mention insisted larvae um, because if they're not in the lumen, the hollowed area of the gut, and they're in the wall, that's slightly tricky to get to those. So when these small strong gyles decide to emerge from the intestinal wall, certainly that could potentially create some damage. Um, so again, here's if we're looking at some histology here, we've got some of our um, insisted small strong gyles there amidst the tissue. But this expulsion has a fancy term, um, larval cyanthostomenosis. And this is when we have a mass population that's going to erupt into the lumen from the walls. Uh, and we're in, again, the horse's intestinal tract. This generally occurs late winter, spring here in the Northern Hemisphere. Generally, you see it with younger horses, one to four years old. Uh, and so what symptoms of the, as a horse caretaker owner might you see? So the horse, they may have uh, watery diarrhea. They could be dehydrated. We could see some edema or swelling. Um, sometimes sudden weight loss, and then certainly uh, one of our most dreaded things, colic. Um, so uh, the severity can range, um, but and you might not see all of these, but it might cause some combination of them. So why might this happen? Uh, again, you know, we, I said a few slides back, they're generally considered not terribly pathogenic. They're not really causing serious disease in our horses, but there can be situations where we do have a, a health issue on our hand. So we generally see this tied back to some improper deworming practices. So the small strong gyles are accumulating in the gut of the horse. Um, we're not having a routine deworming protocol for these horses. And then we have a large emergence all at once of these small strong gyles. And again, it can cause some damage to the gut wall. Some of those other symptoms we've just shown as well, like the diarrhea and the colic. Again, we, we can see it in fact triggered by deworming, if you have, especially if you haven't dewormed your horse in a long time. Again, young horses also seem to be prone to this. Um, you know, the care for this is mostly supportive, right? Um, so again, not necessarily going to be a death sentence for your horse, but it can be scary. It can be um, cause some problems that might take some time to, to heal for your horse. So Control of the small strong gyles is key. Again, I'm going to say this several times. We're never going to get rid of all the parasites in horse, but we want to keep them to a manageable level. So 
and maybe I should have jumped to this slide first, but we're going to keep parasite populations under a manageable level and try to reduce egg shedding. And also importantly, and I'll talk a little bit about this, slow parasite resistance. So the best analogy would be like antibiotic resistance, right? And I'm sure you've heard in human medicine that there are some, you know, bacteria that just some pair these super bugs, right? That people like they try all these different antibiotic drugs and nothing works. And we're not quite that bad on the parasite side, but things aren't great. Um, and so to make sure that the few types of dewormers we have available still work, uh, we need to try and slow that level of resistance. So we're not trying to eliminate every single parasite from our horse, but let's control them, let's slow down resistance and reduce egg shedding. So a couple of things to think about here. One good thing for us is that horses can develop immunity to worms. Um, so a good example of this is the ascarids, which I mentioned if we were talking young horses here, um, I would talk more about. But in horses that are, you know, once they hit two years old, three years old, we most of them have um, very low to no levels of, of, of ascarids, especially if they're not on a farm with young horses. And we don't know really why that is that they develop this immunity once they hit about two years old, but they just seem to. On top of that, when it comes to strong guiles, we see a range of um, what we'll talk about shedding categories where some horses are low shedders, some are moderate, some are high. So it seems to be pretty variable between horses, you know, what their egg shedding level will be. It's kind of like if you know someone gets sick all the time and someone that doesn't get sick any of the time, similar idea here. We do know that whatever shedding category you put your horse in, it's very stable once they're about three to four years old through probably up till the early 20s, right? Till they start to see some aging happening. Um, it can change. Um, they might be become a little more susceptible if they're stressed or they get sick. But if your horse at age five is classified as a moderate shedder and they stay healthy, they'll be a moderate shedder for, for years. Um, so that's good to know. Um, other thing to think about, a key rule here is that 20% of adult horses are going to shed 80% of the eggs. So the 80-20 rule. This means if we had five horses, that just one horse will be responsible for 80% of the eggs that are shed out in the manure. So maybe some of you remember, and may, I hope not too many still do, but it was pretty routine to deworm horses about, you know, every two months, whole barn, um, just go through and that's what you do. And we're starting to realize that that's not great. That is leading to the resistance problem. And it's really not needed for most horses. Um, so there are high shedders, yes, but they are in the minority. Most horses are low to moderate shedders. So how do I figure out what shedding category my horse is in? Uh, you need to have a fecal egg count done. This is a thing that most vet practices will offer. Uh, again, if you are in the Pennsylvania area or within driving distance, we offer parasite workshops a couple times a year. We try to rotate around the state. So you can check that out as well. And you just need some, a manure sample from your horse. And it's a very simple test with a microscope. And we're focusing here um, on small strong eggs specifically to get this number. So a low shedder would be considered to have zero to 200 eggs per gram. That's what EPG stands for, moderate 200 to 500, and a high shedder at 500 plus. Two points to consider. This is not indicative of the total parasite control. So again, this number is based on the strong guile eggs you're counting. So it doesn't take into account, you know, bots, pinworms, tapeworms, all those other things. Um, it also doesn't even for all the strong guiles take into account because if you've got, um, you know, this is just the eggs, doesn't look at the larva or the adults. Um, and if you've insisted larva, we, we can't really count for that. So we're looking at one particular stage of the life cycle of, of one parasite. And timing is important when performing fecal egg counts. We're getting to about the time of the year where um, not quite, depends where you are in the country or world. Um, I still have snow on the ground and patches where I am right now. But if we're performing a fecal egg count, you know, when it's cold in the den of winter, when there's low parasite activity, you're not going to get a true, um, I guess, count of what your shedding category is. Another thing to consider is when you last dewormed your horse. If you just dewormed your horse uh, within a few weeks of, say you want to do a fecal egg count and you dewormed your horse three weeks ago, that's not going to be good for the fecal egg count test because you've just dewormed your horse. And assuming it's an effective dewormer, that's going to have eliminated a lot of those eggs. So think about when you last dewormed your horse and what the season is. Again, this is where you can talk with your veterinarian. Is, is now a good time? Should I wait um, to determine if you have never done a fecal egg count, what time to do it? So these dewormers, many, many different products out there, not promoting any on the screen, just giving you some examples. If you've been in a tack shop or tractor supply, there's, there's endless options. 
But if you get down to the nitty gritty and look at the small, very tiny font uh, that's on a lot of these packages, like the little tiny words right under uh, the safeguard here, and we think about the chemical classes, we just have three major classes. So a chemical class means that the drugs in that chemical class all more or less work in the same way to against the parasite. Maybe they affect the metabolism of the parasite, maybe they paralyze them, but they work in a similar method. So we have benzimidazoles, pyrimidines, and macrocyclic lactones. So they're three major classes of dewormers. And I listed in parentheses uh, some subsets. So like, for example, many of you probably familiar with ivermectin or moxidectin. They're both considered macrocyclic lactones. So something to think about when you're looking at your different deworming products and, and what to buy, um, while they have lots of different clever and witty names, they really are generally in three major classes. Each class is going to focus on a slightly different subset of parasites to target, and we'll look at that in just a second. There are two minor classes. There is a dewormer product called Prazenquantel. Um, this one is considered minor. It only is going to impact tapeworms, and it is sold in combination with a macrocyclic lactone. So you can't buy Prazaquantil by itself. Uh, the piperazines I starred, they were around decades ago, if anyone here remembers having to tube your horse to give them the dewormer. Um, so that's certainly not a very um, useful and, and user-friendly thing to do, although some could argue even with the products today, it's not always easy to deworm your horse. But certainly tubing was not not very useful. You had to need a you needed a large amount of piperazine for the deworming. So um, that's not really on the market anymore. So this information in this table is derived from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the AAP. They have a wonderful PDF called Internal Parasite Guidelines. It is free. You can Google it right now since you're on a webinar and download it. It's about 20 pages, lots of great information that is certainly at the level that, that you as horse owners and caretakers could read. So again, that's from the AAEP, the Internal Parasite Guidelines. Uh, highly recommend that as one of your resources. So they have a similar table, and this is just showing uh, the three main chemical classes I just talked about, as well as Prezaquantel, the parasites they target, and then some of the common trade names, again, not endorsing any of these products. So as you can see, benzimidazoles, pyrimidines, macrocyclic lactones, there are a variety of parasites that each one will target. But we have resistance. And it is interesting because it depends on what your dewormer is and what the parasite is, what the levels of resistance are. So again, this table derived from information from the AAP, it's looking at the three major classes of dewormers, also known as anthelmintics, focusing on small strong isles, large strong isles, and ascarids. And we're looking at whether there is widespread resistance, meaning it's there is resistance on multiple continents with high farm prevalence. If it is common, uh, reported on multiple continents with varying farm prevalence or early indications where you might have individual farms that have reported reduced uh, efficacy or in other words, it's not working as well. So we see with our small strong isles that they're fairly resistant to the benzimidazoles and the macrocyclic lactones are generally going to work best for them. Okay, Large strong guys, again, not really a problem anymore these days, so we don't see any issues. Um, again, we're not really deworming for them at this point. Our ascarids, we see kind of the flip for what we saw for small strong guys, where they are widely resistant to the macrocyclic lactones, uh, and we only have early indications in our other two drug classes. So again, thinking about what parasite are you targeting, again, if you have young horses and we are thinking about ascarids, concerning what product you want to use to deworm, um, taking this all into consideration. So again, it is an individual plan for what to do with your own horse, but if you were just talking base treatments, again, this is coming from, uh, from the AAP. So for adult horses, and I stress adult, because if we're dealing with weanlings uh, and yearlings, there is a different protocol for those. It's in that um, internal, that guideline I talked about from the AAP. If you have adult horses, we're, it is, suggested to be worm one to two times per year, um, focusing on those strong aisles, um, the tapeworms, the bots. Um, you can generally, they suggest a prazaquantel ivermectin moxidectin combo in the fall, early winter, and then, you know, whatever your other treatment to be in the spring. If you have a higher moderate cheddar, you're probably going to do one to do additional treatments during the grazing season uh, for small strong aisles. So at best, if you had a high cheddar, maybe four times a year deworming. So we're still not at that old rule of, you know, every eight weeks. So looking at six times a year, 
um, looking at most four times a year for a high shedder. And we said, you know, 80% of parasites come from 20% of the horses. So that you should have few high set shedders, very few, some more moderate shedders and quite a few um, low shedders. Okay. Um, so again, work with your veterinarian to figure out where you fall in terms of how many times deworm per year. But, you know, pretty much every horse should be getting at least once to twice a year a deworming treatment. Now that's for your individual horse, but really we need to also think about, if we can, the whole farm. And I appreciate for many of you that board your horse, you don't have control over the whole farm, but maybe this is where you have a discussion with your other um, fellow boarders, maybe the farm manager, see what we can be doing. Again, we would like to try to keep our parasite population under control and low. And so for only doing our fecals and managing for one horse like here, and there's manure, um, we do have these other horses that could still come into um, contact with those parasites. So really it is most efficient to work as a whole farm unit. And I, again, I appreciate the practicality of that if you don't actually own your own farm. But if you can talk with others on the farm about this, it is really best for parasite control. So deworming is great, but again, we do have to think about resistance. And the reality is there's also a lot of management practices that we can do to help to control parasite spread and manage parasite levels. So the pasture is a key area for our small strong guiles. This is a typical pasture we see here. Horses generally don't graze evenly. We tend to have a shortened lawn area and a higher rough area. Generally that happens because they don't want to graze where they um, have their manure. So they'll try to avoid it and the grass grows up around it. And they have found in studies that the L3 strong isle larvae are ten, tend, to be, tend to be 10 to 15 times higher in amounts in this rough area than the lawn. So some things you could try to do, removing manure. Again, if you have a large pasture, maybe that's not quite practical to get that done. Um, managing your horse density, make, maintaining, you know, they suggest one to two acres per horse. Um, try not to overgraze. Uh, if you can rotationally graze, that's another um, potential way to think about that. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Using hay feeders, if you can get hay off the ground where there's no chance for that to mix with any manure or mud or things like that, that can limit the spread. I mentioned pasture rotation. It is a great tool we talk about a lot in pasture management. Um, but in terms of if you want to control parasites with pasture rotation, you really, if you're gonna do it, the horses need to be off that pasture for about a year. And again, not practical in many situations. Um, if you have other livestock like cattle, maybe you can rotate with them because again, different species of parasites so we don't have cross-contamination. People like to ask about spreading manure to you know, drag it across the field. Well, the problem with that is now you know that contained rough where the parasites were, now I just spread them all across the field. And we need to have really hot, dry temperatures like above 100 degrees, low humidity for up to a week. Uh, and we don't generally have that weather here in the Northeast. Um, so that's a problem for us. So it can't just be one or two days, maybe in the 90s. We tend to be super humid up here. It's got to be dry heat, hot for a while. And we just don't get that weather. So something to think about. Dry lots can be useful. Again, when thinking about small strong aisles since they live in the grass. Uh, and composting works. So if you did want to put manure back out in the field, maybe compost it. Composting when done correctly, like you're actually turning it, monitoring the heat, can kill the, the eggs of these parasites. So again, it's more active than just you have a pile of manure that sits behind your barn for several months. You actually have to compost it correctly, but it can kill the parasitic eggs. So the seasons, one final thing uh, to think about here with our parasites. Again, think this was based more in the Northeast, which I we did see most many from Pennsylvania, New Jersey here, but so our strong guiles, I just mentioned hot weather. Yes, it can kill them, but we've got to be you know, I have here at summer 104 degrees or higher, which not always typical here. And the moist fecal balls will actually protect the larva uh, even when it's hot. So again, dragging, if you get above 105 can kill them, but that's got to be a certain temp situation. So you think, okay, what about the winter? Surely the cold weather it hits zero degrees here. That'll kill them, right? No, not so much. Um, while it can, um, you know, the, the eggs in the L3 can survive for several months. It will, they can basically kind of just hibernate more or less. I'm trying to bring that word over here. The snow cover can actually be protective and insulate them. What will kill them is freeze thaw cycles because it'll disrupt the membranes around the eggs um, and that will destroy the eggs. Um, but just the cold weather, that, that won't do it for them. 
Ideal times for these parasites are going to be spring and fall, or if we just want to base it on temperature, you know, upper 70s to low 90. Um, those eggs can advance to the L3 stage in about four days. Um, so really rapid development. So, you know, if you're trying to manage manure on your field, you need to be picking it up at least once a week um, to really, if you want to limit the spread of these eggs and their development to larva. So all of this to say as we wrap up the worm side of things that our horses will always have some level of parasites. So goal is not to eradicate, it's to control and manage. Uh, and while we can certainly think of the individual approach using our fecal egg counts and dewormers, uh, if you can manage a whole farm approach, that is best. So you can use some of those management techniques for your pasture and farm. And I would encourage you, if you haven't talked with your veterinarian, to work with them to, if you've never done a fecal egg count, conduct that on your horse, see what shedding category they're in, and figure out what is the best plan for your horse and your farm. All right, I'm going to jump here and now talk about ticks for a little bit. So ticks are pretty common in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And frankly, I mean, broadly speaking, we see them in many, many places. Um, they are human, a health concern for both humans and horses. So I picked just three species of ticks here on this slide. So I have the black-legged tick, and this is the one that can spread Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, which we'll talk about more. Uh, the American dog tick and the lone star tick. And these three pictures show in yellow where they're found in the United States. Um, so I do appreciate with many of you logged in from other states and other parts of the country and world that there are other varieties of ticks, uh, but I'm going to focus on, on these. And I, from just these three ticks on this slide, I listed all the potential diseases that humans can get from them. I'm sure someone in the audience knows or has unfortunately had one of these diseases. Um, so they run the full gamut from Lyme, anaplasm, maybe part of the meat allergy, rash illness, all sorts of different lovely things we can get from these ticks. And I'm going to focus um, certainly on Lyme disease for the couple sets of slides. And we are a pretty big hot spot in the Northeast for Lyme. So this map was from uh, looking at reported cases of Lyme disease in humans. I will admit there's a lot more data out there for tick-borne diseases in the human world than horses. We're slowly getting there, but not to level you can find pretty easily like on the CDC website. Uh, this shows cases from 1990 to 2020. And you can see that the darker the green, the, the worse it is. And so the Northeast, and then we usually see around the Great Lakes as well, pretty high caseloads for Lyme disease. Um, Pennsylvania pretty regularly ranks as number one in the country for number of Lyme disease cases. I know New Jersey, you also get your share. And again, if you're in any of these other states, you've probably seen this. So the two diseases to talk briefly about here are Lyme and anaplasmosis because horses can get both of these diseases. And they're considered the two primary tick-borne diseases in North America. I should have added for horses here on this topic, um, but for horses specifically. So um, Lyme and anaplasmosis. And again, not a lot of data out there on caseloads that we've found in horses, not like we have the extent of knowledge in humans. Um, some small areas where we found some information um, from the USDA in 2018, it was reported that over 15% of equids and almost 30% of horse operations reported tick infestations. Uh, there was an interesting study done in Pennsylvania going on two years ago now where they looked at antibody levels. So antibodies are produced in response to a disease. So it's kind of a, um, a fingerprint or a leftover of when a disease has happened in an animal. And so they looked at these two bacteria. So this first one um, is what causes anaplasmosis and the next one is what causes Lyme. And they found that these horses, they sampled almost 300, nearly half of them had antibody levels in response to anaplasmosis and over 75% or 77% had levels, antibody levels in response to Lyme. So our horses are definitely being exposed to these two diseases. Now, the good news here is that these two diseases, um, you know, they're rarely fatal. They're not like rabies or our, um, you know, EHV diseases, our Western Eastern encephalopathies. Um, many horses don't appear to show symptoms. Again, it was a surprise to these researchers in 2022, these high levels, especially for Lyme disease. Um, so they're not usually fatal. That being said, I know if you've had a horse with one of these, it's not something to just shrug off. It can be Difficult to diagnose. Um, a lot of these symptoms are quite vague. So I listed the ones for Lyme on the left and anaplasmosis on the right. So there are quite a few different uh, diseases that can cause some of these symptoms. Um, it's While there are tests available for both of them, 
Um, it can be difficult sometimes to actually get that positive result. So it's usually working with your veterinarian. What are the symptoms? What's their exposure been like um, to see what to do with your horse? So it can take several months. It can take a while to recover. It certainly can impede performance of your horse. Uh, so I know it's not fatal, but it can be a problem. It can cause a lot of issues for your horse. It can be expensive to manage. Um, so we need to think about that. So here's another life cycle picture, a little bit more involved than for our small strong guile. And a rule of thumb here with ticks is that they follow a two, three, four rule and that they have a two year life cycle, three hosts and four life stages. So again, I'm focusing here on the black legged tick because that is the tick that will transmit both Lyme and anaplasmosis. So they start off in the spring as eggs. They will mature that summer of their first year into larva. And at that point, they will have their first host. So they will attach onto a host. Usually it's small at this point. So it shows birds and, and small rodents. Um, they will feed and then they'll drop off again. And they'll go through the fall and the winter into spring where they have now matured into nymphs. And now they are ready for their second feed. And so now at this point, they're ready for, for bigger prey. So that could be sure still your mice and, and small rodents, but anything up from dogs, cats, humans, deer, horses, um, all fair game at this stage. Then we continue through summer. So we're in the second year now. And by the fall, they are adults and they will need their third feeding. And so similar set of hosts as we had in the spring. So our pets, um, the deer, mice, uh, humans, and horses. And then they are going to lay their eggs over the winter and the life cycle continues. Okay. So in terms of transmitting tick-borne diseases, certain life stages are problems at different times of the year. So this is a graph pulled from the CDC looking at the seasonal activity of black-legged ticks. Again, the ticks that transmit uh, the bacteria that cause Lyme and anaplasmosis. And we've got our adults are in this yellow-orange color. The nymphs are in black right here. And the larvae are in this navy blue. And important thing to point out, it's not just the adults that can spread diseases, the nymphs can as well. And that's also an issue because nymphs are like super small. They're very hard to see. Yeah, adults can be hard to see sometimes, but nymphs are very tiny. And so the adults we find to be active, we see this, um, we can see some periods in the spring and then in the fall. Um, and then we see the nymphs during the summer. So really a wide part of the year, we can see tick activity. And it seems like I get reports from people earlier and earlier every year and later and later at the end of the year of seeing ticks, um, especially when we get warmer days. Uh, you know, my just talking with my dad last night on the phone and he lives in Kansas and they had 80 degree weather yesterday, which is wild to me. I'm sure there are ticks out and about in that type of weather. So uh, it's not unusual to start seeing, still see ticks now almost for most of the year, it seems. So with our ticks, you know, at least with our, our worms, we have dewormers. For ticks, you know, we don't really have great preventatives. There's not vaccines for most species. You know, there is a Lyme vaccine for for dogs, there has been a vaccine for humans and there's a new one coming out. There's nothing on the horse side officially. Um, so really we need to think about tick prevention for limiting tick-borne diseases. Key point to remember is that ticks spend most of their life in the environment, you know? Um, again, they have three hosts that they need, but they latch on the feed and then they drop off and that's that. Um, and so trying to keep the ticks either off the animal or removing them as fast as possible because there's also usually like a 24, 48 hour window in which to get, get that tick off of you before they can actually transmit the disease from you. So if you find a tick three hours after it lashed on and you pull it off, you're, you're probably good to go in terms of disease. Uh, so thinking of the horse here, we need to consider their pasture, the environment around the pasture, what to do in the horse itself, and then also how to perform tick removal. So in pastures, we want to reduce areas where ticks and their hosts like to live. So some, some suggestions here, if we take a look at these two pictures on the bottom, on the left is what not to do, and on the right is what you should do. So we don't want fence lines right up against the woods. I realize Pennsylvania, New Jersey, many other areas, that can be very challenging where there's lots of woods across the area. But if you can, um, especially if you're, you have bought a new farm or you're doing renovations, if you can pull that fence line or tear down trees right outside the fence line, um, that is best. And then you can also mow. So you can see in this picture on the right, not only the trees farther back, we have mowed on this side. So um, the ticks would be more exposed. The wildlife, that's not going to be an ideal environment for them. They like shaded nooks and crannies of where to live. So limiting brush and woody debris is also going to be important. Um, you know, if you get fallen branches, things like that, you want to be picking them up. Manage that leaf litter, pull that back. Um, 
you know, so really managing around the, along the fence line of those pastures is going to be important. Further out from the pastures, if you happen to back up to woods or things like that, um, there are some ways we can manage ticks. So one thing you could do is to target the wild hosts of these ticks, particularly our white-tailed deer and, and the rodents, the mice. Um, so there's a couple different products out there. So for example, there is a four post deer feeder. Um, it has grain in these bins and it's got these little um, like foam covered um, insulator things and they are, have product like a pyrethroid that will then be applied to the animal. It spins and it's kind of treating the, the deer basically to lessen tick load. Uh, similar idea with the tick tubes, which is on the left and the rodent bait box on the right where you somehow want to get the animal treated. So we apply the chemical to either little cotton in the tick tubes or this box will have kind of like the deer feeder, but inside um, to coat the animal and then prevent ticks latching on. So those are options. There are, if you, you know, pesticides that you could spray in the area or um, the category of them is the acaricides. I'm not a fan of this. Um, they are not, limited to just ticks. So you are likely to be impacting other animals and insects in the environment, like honeybees and other things. Not great for areas with water, it's gonna impact the aquatic life. Um, so it is an option if you have like a real tick issue, but I am leery of it just because of the number of, of harmful effects on the environment that it can have. So if you were going to use um, one of your wild host control mechanisms, you need to think about where to put this a product. So picture here of a uh, property. We've got our horses and animals in this pasture and the <clears throat> little tubes here, you would apply just along the perimeter along the fence line. Again, the goal being to not get ticks onto where your horses are or you are, but kind of keep them contained within the forested area. So you don't feel like you need to fill your forest area with these um, Products, if you line along the property edge where you want to limit the spread of them, that's the most effective way to do it. So what about for your horse itself? What can we do to help your horse? There are all sorts of topical products out there, some sprays and roll-ons and wipes. Um, they're gonna contain those pyrethroids, the same things that we're treating the wild hosts with. Um, some things to think about, they are, they are short-term. So you know, if you're gonna go for a trail ride, that would work. But if you're trying to, your horse lives out on pasture most of the day, they're not gonna last more than you know an hour to a few hours. And if then if you factor in like if it rains or they roll, it could be even less time. So if you are going to use them, um, make sure you do apply correctly. So you should use a mitt or a rag and spray onto that really close to it and then wipe down the horse. I, we are all guilty, I'm sure, of just spraying the horse blindly, but that's wafting into the air. It's not an effective use of your product. Um, so make sure you are applying correctly. <clears throat> you should, again, look for uh, products that contain pyrethroids. There are some natural products out there. There's not a lot of research done on them. There is research going on. Um, so in terms of like, what's the best product to use, which many people want to know, I don't have the best answer. It's usually looking for, does it have pyrethroids? Um, and applying it correctly are going to be more important. There is the option for treated clothes. So if you have, you know, shopped at REI or something, you can buy hiking clothes that are treated um, with permethrin to repel the ticks. And there are some products um, where you could, or you could, there are some companies you can send in, whether it's your, the blanket of your horse and get that treated. There's not a lot of data out there so far as to how effective it is. We are actually, um, this is some of the research that we're working on at Penn State. So this is from our study. These horses have masks <clears throat> and boots on, and we've treated some, and we haven't treated others, and we are trying to figure out how effective they are. So stay tuned for that information. We do highly endorse doing tick checks on your horse and yourself for sure, but your horse too. So often a forgotten thing. Daily tick checks are best, again, because you have that window where we can, if you can pull that tick within 24 hours or so, we really reduce the likelihood of um, infection. If you say, or you don't have time for the whole body of the horse, there are key areas to target. So, you know, we did a study a few years back and we asked people, where are you finding ticks on your horses? And in this picture, the areas in red were where they were more likely to find ticks. And this was specific to Pennsylvania. Um, and we do generally recommend you check 
you know, under the jaw, along the neck, between the legs, behind the tail head. These are key areas where ticks, again, moist, warm, safe areas where they want to be. Um, so you could focus on key areas if, if needed, if you don't have time for the whole body. You can make or buy your own kit. So here's a picture. We do sell a kit through Penton Extension um, that you can buy on our website. And again, it does help to use tweezers and to pull the tick correctly. Um, and then, you know, either wash off if it's it's you or the horse or use a little bit of, of an antibiotic just right in that area um, to help protect your horse. So our take home message here on ticks, uh, again, if you're in the Northeast, Lyme and anaplasmosis are your main diseases to worry about. Management's key as, as we don't have a vaccine to prevent them. Um, and so management of your pastures, the environments can help reduce tick numbers. And then on the management side, doing daily tick checks um, should be important part of your routine horse care. Get into the habit of when you go out before you ride and when you're grooming your horse, do your daily tick check. Um, as you get quickly versed in it, it won't take more than a couple minutes to do. I wanted to at the very end here just thank my team because um, again uh, we have four of us here in Pennsylvania so not only myself but Bethany Bickle and Laura Kenny and Olivia Watson are all involved in our um, educational material on ticks and parasite and more. I also have to give a shout out to Erica Mochtinger um, as our veterinary entomologist who helped a lot with our tick projects and as I said we do have additional events coming up in the future. Uh, if you are in the Pennsylvania area we do things like parasite workshop we have one coming up um, I think in March. Yes, March. And then we do online information just like Dr. Williams is doing tonight. So I know our next webinar for Penn State is in April about donkey care. Um, so check out our website. And that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Smarsh. That was fantastic. So I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions, I'm not going to be looking at them in the chat. You need to put them in the Q&A. Um, we've got a bunch of them, so I'm going to start asking her, but um, we'll go through them. If we don't get to your question orally or live, I did ask Dr. Smarsh to stick around for a little bit. Um, she's going to, when I'm introducing the next speaker, she's going to go ahead and, and work on any questions that I might not get to. But what I was kind of hoping to do, Danielle, is to start with some of the parasite questions and then move to some of the tick questions, because you definitely have a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first off, at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned edema. Can you just explain a little bit more about what that is and where the horse owner would notice that edema? Yeah, so edema is just a fancy word for swelling. So you'd feel you would you could feel the puffiness if you were palpating or touching the horse's legs. Um, that's generally we see edema in the horse is going to be in the lower limbs. So they'll just, uh, their joints won't be as well defined. Like if you look at like the fetlock, for example, it would just look more kind of straight up and down. So edema is just, it's swelling. Awesome. Um, got a couple on this one. What are, is your thought on either the feed through dewormers or like the daily dewormers? Do they really, and, and the theory is that they contribute to the resistance. Um, is that true? And what are your thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, we, years ago worked a lot with this tick, uh, parasite stuff with Martin Nielsen at University of Kentucky and he has done a lot of great little videos on this and we've talked about daily feed throughs and they're generally not as well recommended as our one to two to three times per year it is there is the concern about resistance um, and you know it, it's they're just really not as effective long term to use them mm -hmm. the short answer <laughs> yeah no that's great so you just mentioned the Kentucky research and there is a nice question on it. I think I'm going to have to read it because I couldn't really paraphrase, but um, someone says that they have read that the Kentucky herd hasn't dewormed in over 40 years and they're still having great results. Um, so should people still be deworming their horses if they don't see any issues, um, like I guess with a fecal egg count? Um, and um, and and what is that University of Kentucky research really showing us? It's a good question. And I swear I didn't look at the questions before, so I had no idea that Kentucky had actually been mentioned. That was just happenstance there. <laughs> um, I mean, the problem with most horses is that, I mean, some don't ever leave where they live, but there's usually a lot of transport of horses and moving around to different farms. And again, those parasites can live for a while in an environment. So... I suppose if you had a truly clean pasture, never touched by horses and truly clean horses that had never encountered a parasite, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about that. But I don't know if that's really realistic for that sort of scenario to happen um, at this point. 
Um, as for what it shows with their horses, I don't know what their recent research has been because I've heard of their herd as well. Um, so I don't know what they're up to currently with their research protocols with those that herd. That would definitely be something I know they have an active Facebook page and Dr. Nielsen posts videos and things to check out their website for more information. Good point. Good point. Um, all right, a couple more deworming questions. Um, given the increased uh, resistance of the parasites, um, has there been companies uh, developing new deworming products? And um, is there any promising research out there? Yeah, I wish I had better news, but but no. Um, unfortunately, most drug type products, they can take upwards of 10 years from idea to being on a market and available. And it's just not a lucrative business money wise, which I, I think a terrible reason why they're not doing it, but it just, I mean, dewormers themselves aren't terribly expensive, right? And so there's just no monetary incentive um, to, to make new drugs. All right, well, we're gonna do one more quick deworming one and then we'll move on to some par uh, tick ones and then we're out of time. Um, mm -hmm. Should you use two different classes of dewormers in a year if you're doing a yearly deworming practice? Sure. So, and I, I didn't talk about that, but yes, the one, another kind of old school line was to like rotate your products, right? But again, when you look at the small font on the box, there's only so many, there's three big classes. And a key point that was brought up a couple times in the slides is looking at like whole farms. And so there is varying levels of resistance to different products on different farms. So if you really wanted to get into it, there's a whole little test you can do to see how effective your product is. You basically do fecal egg counts twice before and after deworming and see how effective they are. And so, you know, maybe that class of pyrimidines, maybe that is okay to use on your farm. Maybe, you know, you would have to kind of, again, if you really want to know and be sure, do some tests with that and do some extra really fecal egg count tests. Um, so it is possible that you could use a different chemical class because yes, usually it's farm based. And so that is something to consider. Awesome. Um, is there any data on any um, natural? So we're moving on to ticks, by the way. Um, any natural or herbal sprays that worked on ticks? Yeah, so there is, again, I mentioned Dr. Erica Machtinger, and she's dabbled a little like fly spray products, right? Because a number of fly sprays are also um, meant for ticks. Um, and I know, you know, I think of like on the human side, there's like the, I forgot the lemon based one. There's like a lemon essential lemon oil or whatever, something like that. Don't quote me specifically, but um, there's nothing definitive in like for sure proven that works. That's a natural product that is of interest, uh, especially because when it comes to like fly sprays, there's a lot of resistance in the fly populations now to some of these products. So that is something that some researchers are starting to look into. Can we use some of these other natural products? Uh, probably some of the same limitations as, as a chemical based one where, you know, you have to think about the sun and if your horse gets muddy or rolls, like they're also going to reduce time of effectiveness, but um, it is a possibility. All right, I think we have time for one or two more quick ones. Um, so what if your horse reacts to the tick bites? Like, you know, it swells up and it oozes. Um, is there any suggestions to reduce that reaction? Yeah, so, you know, if you're able to catch the tick before, you know, if you pull the tick off, again, that's where using maybe some antibiotic to clean up that area. Again, if it was a human, we'd, we'd say like wash, right? So if you can wash that area or clean it in some way that can help reduce that. Um, if it's really bad, that's where I'll say contact your vet, right? Maybe we need to use butte or something to bring down that inflammation. Um, and if it's a recurring problem, again, that might be a conversation with your veterinarian of what can we use to try to limit this issue. And I'm assuming this might be similar to a, a vet concern, but similar to cre decreasing the risk of infections. But what about de decreasing the risk of Lyme disease or anaplasmosis? Is there anything other than just controlling the ticks that you would recommend for controlling the disease? Yeah, I really don't have a good, I mean, I feel like I've got some just like sad endings here for parasites. And I, I don't have a good suggestion, you know, part the ticks are just, they're very prevalent, right? So um, in terms of reducing the spread, and I, like I said, that study from Pennsylvania two years ago, it seems like most horses, I mean, they're out in the grass in the pasture. We know like deer come through and mice come through our pastures all the time. I, I think that's kind of a, a lost cause at this point. So again, we can, you know, control for your horse, but I don't know 
ticks are spreading their habitats too. If you look at some of the maps from the CDC, where they are every year seems to get bigger and bigger. So, yay! Well, on that fun high note, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Swartz, Danielle, thank you so much. You do have, I want to say, there's another six, eight questions if you don't mind sticking around and answering sure. them. Sorry we didn't get to them live. Um, but let's give her all a wonderful um, virtual round of applause. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce our next speaker and ask Dr. Heine to um, come onto her screen and share her screen as well. Um, she's another wonderful friend and colleague of mine. She's the extension specialist for, uh, or equine extension specialist and associate professor at Oklahoma State University. She's in the animal and food sciences department. Um, she serves both youth and adult audiences in the state of Oklahoma and throughout the U.S. She's taught and produced a lot of educational materials related to equine nutrition, reproduction, health, and management. She also has an interest in equine behavior and behavior, uh, equine behavior and the promotion of welfare of show horses. She also teaches companion animal management and is an avid dog trainer and agility competitor. Awesome. So with that being said, I will let you go ahead and take it away. Okay, well, fantastic. So um, thank you so much for the invite to talk about this. And again, um, I am interested on the kind of the behavior and well-being side of horses. And specifically, uh, you know, just like uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Smarsh, we're interested in education. And so this uh, project that I'm going to talk to you about um, and this information kind of comes from that uh, connection. So while we don't want to think about pain in horses, it's definitely a reality. Um, and so we are going to um, go through, if my computer is going to cooperate, there we go. Now she's over here. Here we go. Is it advancing? <laughs> no, it's actually not advancing. There we go. Oh, there you go. Now it's advancing. <laughs> so... Um, what I'm going to actually be presenting to you guys is uh, actually a piece of a larger project that is um, raised. That's what we've called it, which is recognizing affective states in equine. So this project is actually uh, funded by Morris Animal Foundation. And so the, this is essentially a piece of an educational online tool um, to get people to understand the importance of the emotional state um, of the horse. So um, my colleagues here uh, is this is actually a collaboration between um, three different institutions. So myself um, and the young lady to my right there is Miss Amber Wells, who is the master's student that this is her project. And so she uh, really has put together a lot of this instructional material. And then also to other extension specialists, Dr. Kathy Anderson at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and Dr. Colleen Brady. So this has been kind of a, a multi-year project for us to pull this together. So, but for tonight, and we'll, I'll talk about Ray's a little bit later on, um, we're really gonna focus on pain. And it is sometimes really overlooked by horse owners, the importance of recognizing pain, obviously for the welfare of the animal, we wanna minimize pain. But oftentimes, um, this, a horse in pain can really disrupt the horse-human bond. And so when we're going to be talking about pain tonight, we're going to go past just like a horse that's colicking, right? So we're going to look at maybe sometimes more subtle indicators of pain that people miss um, and also try to um, really emphasize those behavioral changes that sometimes people are missing too that actually can be induced by pain. So that's kind of the, the focus of what we're going to do here. So when we think about identifying pain in the horse, um, this is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, and that's really, if we think about horses, us, other species, uh, there's a reason for that. And that's because pain, right, and how we experience pain is subjective. Um, how I feel pain is going to be different from how you may feel pain. So some people have what we would call a higher pain tolerance. Some people have a lower pain tolerance. And so if you've, um, you know, worked maybe in the medical field and with humans, they actually use this kind of scale 
um, so that it can be comparative to the individual. Because again, it is how that person feels that is important. Well, it's the same thing for the horse. Um, so it is how that individual horse feels about that pain. And I'm sure if we think about different horses in our lifetime, that we kind of have those that are like, oh, if anything's wrong, they're like, oh, I can't go on, like life is over. And then there's some that are like really, um, you know, hardworking or work addicts that will kind of push through that. And so it's important that we can still recognize perhaps those more subtle indicators and those forces that maybe aren't as visible. So again, it's really hard uh, because it is an individual experience. The other issue with horses um, is that so often pain is mislabeled by horses that are being naughty or he's being lazy or, you know, you even hear people like he's trying to get even with me or something. And they're completely missing that a lot of these behaviors, that these unwanted behaviors that we may see may be coming from a place of pain. And so as a horse industry and horse owners, I think we need to do a better job of recognizing when horses are showing us some of these behaviors and attribute it to the right thing. So with horses too, just due to the nature of their species, sometimes pain is difficult to detect. So maybe masking the pain is the wrong terminology, but they may not be very visible sometimes in their in their pain. Um, and just even when we think about our, our companion animals, sometimes people miss pain signs, especially in cats. Cats are notorious because it's in their best interest to really not show observable pain. Um, and so we really have to sometimes look at these subtle cues to figure out what may actually be, be going on. And a lot of times, if there's something else going on in their environment, it may be easy to miss. And what may be the most difficult is horses may not show signs of pain in the presence of humans. And so in my little picture here for this little horse, and again, the, the educational tool goes through this in a lot more detail than what I can do in just this evening. But if I'm walking through a barn, right, and, um, you know, it's normally horses kind of come to the, the front of the stall or it's feeding time. If I have a horse that's standing like this in the back corner like that, that kind of, for me, sends up some red flags because that is not normal behavior. Okay, so horses typically are going to be a little bit more social. And so that may be one of those very, very subtle signs that, yes, something is, is actually wrong. And so in horses, pain is actually pretty challenging to observe. And there's actually research on this as well. And so forgive me, I was trying to take a picture through this window and there were cobwebs. So I should have wiped that off first. <laughs> but oftentimes the, the best way to observe pain is looking at behavior changes of those horses when you are not present. Well, that's pretty difficult because unless we've got video cameras, which a lot of our bigger, you know, surgical um, suites or veterinary hospitals may have, the average owner, just by the very fact that you're going into that environment, is changing how that horse behaves. So having remote viewing sometimes gives us insight into how that horse is actually showing um, behavior. So um, an important consideration that your horse may be masking um, when you are present with them. The other thing when we're thinking about pain in horses is that, and this is again, almost like us as well, is that pain is judged on a continuum, right? And so it's not always just yes, no, but how bad? Um, what is the severity of that pain? And when we're talking about equine well-being, for me, it's also super important, well, how long is he experiencing that pain? So that's one of those, is it better to have a more severe pain for a shorter period of time, or is it better to have mild chronic pain, right? And so chronic pain can be as large of an impediment to equine well-being as, you know, like this, you know, horse has a hoof abscess. Um, and then certainly the frequency. And so a lot of times when we think about should it be treated or we think about quality of life, 
how often the horses are experiencing pain is an important indicator of how it should be addressed and maybe changes in how we're using the horse or what we're considering um, with their life. So um, when we're going to do this lecture here, um, I want to again focus on beyond the easy. So I am hopeful that everybody in the audience here, if you saw this, right, so you saw this injury and the horse is standing on his toe, theoretically, I'm assuming everybody is going to get that right. That yes, that is an easy to see horse not bearing weight on a limb is easy, but we want to talk about what is maybe a little bit more difficult to see. So um, we're going to talk about some subtle things that people miss. So I've tried to pick pictures that are sort of illustrative of the concept. And what I was going to try to do, I don't know um, if I can do this at the same time with sharing screen, is to let you drop into the chat maybe what you see or what you think I'm trying to depict by um, this image here. And unfortunately, I don't know that I can see the chat. So Kira, you I may can have read to them. Yep, I'll What's read up? them. Uh, if, if you guys do want to type in the chat, and I'll read them as they come through for Dr. Heine. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing yet. <laughs> Everybody's like, he's fine. <laughs> so. yeah. Looks great. Where everybody's so focused on the Q&A. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Horse, oh, now they're all flying in. Horse off in rear left. Hock issues. Keeping mm -hmm. weight off one leg. Mm -hmm. Shifting weight. Uncomfortable in the hind left. Yeah, so this is mm -hmm. where, you know, again, a snapshot in time, which is what a picture is, right, is always hard to tell. So if I saw a horse like this, then I would want to know how often is he doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Is this just he's taken a rest and he's cocked that leg? Or is, is me as a manager and as an owner, is it always the same leg? If it is always the same leg that the horse cocks, and if you see him, you know, after walking around, he immediately starts to cock that leg. So even if you do not see lameness, shortness of stride, et cetera, that should be a red flag for you. Okay. So a horse that is not, or is consistently resting one leg more than another, even if he walks off sound, that is, again, these are little subtle indicators that something could be going on. Uh, so this one is probably a little bit more easy, so I don't probably have to have you chat or type in the chat for this one. But again, if a horse is holding the toe on the ground, this is not a normal stance. So whereas my horse, and I'll click back to him, um, again, if they're just kind of cocking a leg, um, that's different than this would be a lot more of this horse is just resting only kind of on the, the tip of that toe. So looking for how is that horse bearing weight on his legs? Again, some things are pretty obvious. Some things may be a little bit more subtle in how they present. All right, so this one's maybe a little bit harder for what you may think what I'm trying to go for. Anybody want to guess what I'm trying to depict in this one? I don't see any chats yet. Everyone's probably thinking. I know I am. <laughs> Toe pointing, someone said. Signs of arthritis, pointing. Yeah, so we use the term pointing sometimes in, in horses. And so what that would mean, um, and I don't know if you can see me here, but essentially when a horse is again, they're offloading. So those limbs, if they're carried more under the center of their body, that is holding all the weight. So if it's a front limb that is more uncomfortable, if they place that further forward, that horse is actually taking weight off of that limb. So again, you may not see limping, lameness, et cetera, but those subtle patterns of, you know what, he's always placing that one foot ahead of the other uh, is problematic. Now, if I just stop the horse and randomly stop that way, of course, I'm not going to panic and be like, oh, he's not standing square. You're like a showmanship horse. But again, it's looking for those patterns. Does that horse always offload that limb just a little bit by kind of placing it further out um, in front of them away from that body? So subtle things, again, and patterns of behavior are important to kind of recognize. Okay, here's two horses. 
that are, um, I want to see what you guys think with these two pictures. Um, and one of the horses, obviously, you can't see much of the horse. Um, there was kind of a reason for that. <laughs> so we did not really want, um, you know, anybody, you know, with issues with pointing out mm -hmm. unsoundnesses, et cetera. Yeah, you're getting a lot of um, ones camped out, ones camped under, stretched out, parked out, mm -hmm. uh, camped under. So, and the what I like to point out to people, so you're right, the horse on the, the left is, is camped out or, you know, what we call a little bit parked out. So, but sometimes people are like, well, he's just built long, right? Or that's kind of how he stands or that's his confirmation. The... The more you look at horses, you should be able to recognize that's not confirmation. That is actually a horse that is uncomfortable. And so a horse that is standing like that and choosing to stand like that is telling you they have discomfort. Just like the little horse uh, to the right, so my little Palomino horse, that's not confirmation. Okay, so that is not the structure of the horse's hind leg. That is actually a horse that again is shifting weight because they're uncomfortable. And so that again, takes a little bit more of an educated eye to look at horses and be able to see through, well, is this how the structure of the animal is? Or is it, you know, it, it, I'm not gonna say on soundness, but is this discomfort, is this pain? Um, because an animal um, that is comfortable does stand with their legs correctly placed. Uh, and again, if, if you've done a lot of horse judging, you may have thought about this in a different way. So I think it's important to really look at, well, you know, there may be something else going on there um, instead. So we're going to move now to some videos. Um, and these are pretty short little clips and videos for you to watch. Um, and so I do definitely want to give credit. This is a absolutely wonderful article. If you really are interested in, in learning more about observing, um, pain in horses. So this is an article, it's an open access equine discomfort ethogram. Um, and we did get permission to share all these, uh, videos. So, um, we'll just play this one. So horses don't normally shift their weight back and forth that frequently, okay? So if your horse is kind of like treading in place like that or alternating those weight shifts, again, that is an indicator of pain. Will they do it some? Yes, but this is a little bit of the, what is the frequency at which we see this occurring? Um, rapid weight shifts back and forth, again, like that can be um, good indicators of pain as the horse is trying to, you know, trying to get weight off of one leg um, to the next. So uh, good eyes can see that happening pretty easily. Um, so our next one, come on video, go next. There we go. So this is one that I do like to um, point out to people because oftentimes um, we attribute pawing to something else. Um, we think about it as frustration behaviors, um, you know, a horse that's uh, maybe getting ready to roll would paw, but pawing itself can be a sign of pain. And I'll play that horse again. So there are a few behaviors that we're going to uh, go over tonight that in some contexts would be normal behavior. And in other contexts, you need to pay attention to that these are actually um, pain signs. And so in this particular video, this horse is, he also looks like he's, you know, generally you can see he's uncomfortable. There's some tail flagging. He does look like he's trying to think about laying down, but but pawing for no reason uh, can be a good sign of general discomfort and pain in the horse. So I definitely want you guys to think about that, put that in your box of uh, behaviors that we always wanna pay attention to and try to figure out the underlying cause. 
Okay, so um, I thought it would be fun. I have a, a video here. This is just a group of horses and we're gonna have everybody just test themselves. Um, I can't think of a great way for you to type in which horse it is, but maybe we'll play it back and forth a few times and see how good you guys I are. Uh, try to catch the horse that I think is needing of attention. Okay, did everybody get that? Did everybody see a horse? That... Do it one more time if you can, Chris. Oh, but that's real life. <laughs> <laughs> you only get one pass, nice. I, and that is where, um, and I will play it again, but I think it is important to point out, that is why we practice these skills, right? Because in reality, you may only get like, what did I just see? Right. And so your eye has to be kind of ready to look at something and see it pretty quickly, because, again, that may be all you ever get. And someone does say this gray in front, the head was or the neck was going. So gray in front was one of them. OK, I'll play it again. This is fun. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't see anybody else commenting yet. I don't think no one's brave enough. The gray in front limping. Okay, you guys, there are dark all one on the outside. Yeah, the dark one on the outside. That I was trying to figure out how I was gonna say which one I thought, but maybe that's the same one I was saying too. All right, I'll open my rear. Cursor. I think you'll be able to see my cursor, right? Yeah, fourth one from the rear, someone else said. Yeah, so the this dark one towards right the here. back. Yep, exactly. Sure. That was the one I picked out super. So now there may be other ones that may have some slight issues, but that's the one that you should see. And if you had a herd of horses coming in and that that's reality, often that we bring herds of horses in, that's what we need to catch, right? So we, we in an ideal world would train everybody's eye to be able to see that really quickly so that you'd be like, hey, I need to go see that mare or have somebody bring her up to you. Okay, so good job. Okay, so I kind of started with um, the limbs of the horse, but now we're gonna get into the head because again, I think as uh, horse people and maybe because we're riding them and doing some things and we're really interested in gait, we do tend to focus on gait analysis, um, limbs, etc. But the head of the horse has a whole lot to tell us. So we're going to now go to the head and go through some different aspects that will tell us, is the horse in pain? Okay. So this one here is just head position. So I think it's very important for people to recognize there is a difference between neutral and relaxed and a horse that's uncomfortable. So typically a neutral or relaxed head will be more of the pole level with the wither, whereas this should be a little bit of a red flag to you, right? So if you see a horse standing with their head there, that is a horse that we want to go investigate. Okay, so um, again, a normal relaxed horse is not going to just stand around with their head low like that. It'll be much um, higher up into more of a, a neutral or parallel um, plane. So that one's pretty pretty easy to, to figure out. Um, now, what I do wanna point out as we go through these things that if a horse is in pain, um, they may not show all of these things. And there's a difference between generalized pain and the localized pain. And so this is about trying to show you some different postures and behaviors and signs that can indicate pain. Again, we can take a picture of a horse in any circumstance and maybe you want to go eat some grass, right? That his head is low. So it's about um, looking more at the context of what the horse is doing. Okay. All right, come on. Okay, so this kind of goes with that little diagram or the first picture that I showed you of the horse in the stall. Um, we typically expect some degree of alertness in a horse. 
And so if I see a horse that is not really engaging in the environment, um, not really orienting to sound to humans, etc. This can be kind of an indicator of pain. So this is actually a video. So I'm going to play her. And unfortunately, when I videoed this horse, I didn't get a long enough clip of her. Um, so I'll play it one more time. And then I want to also hear what you guys think in the chat about what you may also be seeing in this little Palomino horse. So I had to replay it. I did a bad job videoing it when I saw her. <laughs> Nothing yet. <laughs> Anything that you observe in this horse. And I might be getting a little subtle on this one. But... Say everybody's thinking really hard. Ears moving, someone says. Abdominal glinting. Backing up, shifting weight. Yeah, Licking. so the, sh the shifting of the weight. And to, in context, you would have to know that I am entering into this pen and the horse isn't doing anything. Um, so there's some of that context that's really hard to, to get because you can't see that I am there as well. But anyhow, so, um, so if you look, this little mare is shifting her weight. Um, she's standing at the back of the enclosure, kind of ears are half mass, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, she's not responding to the humans. And then you really do have to kind of get into some subtle stuff. But if you look at her dirt, you see how it's really worn in this one area. So this little horse is just kind of shifting weight back and forth here and ignoring people. So those are, again, good indicators that something is wrong and that she probably has some discomfort going on. So it is, you do have to put all of these things into context. Uh, but again, I know the bigger picture of this particular mare. When you entered into her pain, enter into her pen, we're not getting any response to human, which normally you would do, right? That's you kind of think about it as normal, typical horse behavior. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, we're going to kind of zoom in on the horse here. And then this is a... Um, a new methodology, um, I can't remember how many years this has been out now, but this is actually trying to get people to pay a little bit more attention to the facial features of the horse and detecting pain. So this is a, a tested methodology. This is referred to as the horse grimace scale. And there's essentially six areas of the horse's face that we look at. So I think a lot of horse people are used to thinking about ears of the horse as the ears are where their attention is, right? So the ears forward, they're looking forward. If they're moving, they're paying attention here. Uh, but what you want to look at is horses that hold the ears turned to the outside or back, this can be an indicator of pain. So if we're seeing these kind of airplane ears of these ears that are held um, stiff back or wider apart, that's actually pain. So the ear position can actually mean pain for these horses. Um, we'll go to this one next. So eye tension, I think perhaps a lot of people may be able to read eye tension. Um, and so this would essentially kind of be um, tenting or ridging of the eyelids. So almost where the where we kind of think about worry ridges. Uh, but again, sort of the eye uh, having a lot of tension over the eye that you can see the bone structure a little bit there and the arrow like uh, shape of the eyelid are going to be indicators of pain. Um, the mouth, again, this is something I don't think a lot of people really pay attention to, but tension in the horse's mouth. So we want the lips to be kind of neutral and relaxed. And that horse that is in pain is actually going to almost um, just hold more tension in their mouth, a more of a strained mouth versus that relaxed um, lip. Um, orbital, orbital tightening. 
again, that's a horse kind of getting a little bit of, of squinty eyed with pain. So that one I think is fairly um, understandable. And then um, tension through the facial muscles that you might actually even be able to see the muscles of the horse's cheek. Um, it's a little bit easier, I think, actually on this bay horse in the middle where you can almost see the striations of the cheek muscles. So those, again, indicators of pain. And obviously when we're looking at these horses, uh, like this one, okay, we've got ears, eye, cheek. So they're using kind of the same horse to show you some of these things again and again. Um, and then uh, this, again, this would be kind of our normal happy horse. And then again, we're just, everything about this horse is kind of um, pulled back, lips elongated, ears back, tension in the face. So all of that would be kind of that horse in pain. So again, trying to put a little bit more attention to these subtle signs of pain in a horse versus I'm kicking at my flank, I'm biting, I'm rolling, I'm sweating, like looking for these subtle little changes that indicate that horses are uncomfortable. So this is a video of what I was talking about with the ears. So again, um, the ears not kind of coming forward. You can see how this horse more persistently holds the ears caudally or towards the back. Again, airplane ears, do you see how these ears are further apart than what we would normally see? Um, the horse is showing other things. I think it's, it's pretty easy to see as well in this image. Um, well, maybe I'll ask you, what else other than the ears do you see in this horse, right? We want you to see the ears, but are there other things that you see in my little chestnut horse here? I'll play mm -hmm. them again that you guys can uh, say. Shifting weight, looking at okay. the abdomen. Okay. It just looks colicky. Okay. Chewing. Yep. Very Lift, good. Lifting the leg. All right. So all oh. of this tension, shifting of the weight back and forth. Yeah, they can um, fight against the wall. Mm-hmm. Shifting weight against the wall. You can see the furrowing of the eyes as well. Can you guys see that? I know he's a little bit darker. And then the chewing. All right, those are all really good signs that something is amiss. So again, they don't have to be rolling on the ground before we pick up there's something going on here. Okay, so eyes, um, we're going to focus on the eye of the horse a little bit more and have a little bit closer up pictures here. Um, so this is just a little bit of that kind of ridged um, eyelid that I'm talking about. Um, this can get pretty sharp, again, depending on the degree of pain um, that the horse is in. Um, so this little, this is a video here. So I'll let you watch him. Oops, did I stop him? There you go. So this would be an example of staring. Um, and it can be a little hard to describe other than it's a stare, right? <laughs> so um, kind of this harder stare, this what we would call uh, internally focused versus externally focused. And I, I don't know a better way or really a great word Smith way to describe when a stare is like, you're not taking in the external environment and it's more this internal focus. Does that make sense? Hopefully you guys can kind of see that. I'll play that little pony one more time. So that he's kind of that fixed stare a little bit more. Someone uh, someone commented, Chris, that they're in, they look like they're in the zone. Um, they're just like focused. Yeah, like it's hard to like kind of really explain what that is. But mm -hmm. I mean, I just always think about if I imagine I'm in pain, right? And like, you don't want the world around you. And so you're just sort of like, Ugh. yeah, so that would be kind of that stare. Um, and then this is the muzzle again. And so this is a little bit uh, more zoomed in with some video. So you can see that this is the same little dude. So in this case, what we're looking at in the muzzle of this horse is um, the horse in this case, the nostrils almost get elongated and more square in appearance. So do you see how his nostrils are more squared to 
flaring, but not with the respiration rate. Does that kind of make sense? So again, if you look at the shape of this horse's nostril, um, and this little dude here, he's a, a little laminitic pony. So he is in a fair degree of pain. But these are kind of more of these subtle things, we'll play them one more time, that we want people to try to pick up on a little bit more. So again, not just can he walk or not, but what does that face of that horse actually um, tell you? All right, so here's a test. I've got a horse for you to watch here. Oh, I gotta push the right button. So I see continuous chewing, uncomfortable chewing the cud, ears out flat to the side and constantly chewing. Okay. So yes, and, and the, the chewing is, is right, right? So the mare is constantly kind of chewing. Um, now I did feed her if that helps any. So. Okay. Someone also said going to water, but not able to drink. So yeah, I was confused as to if it was a water trough or a food trough. Yeah, this is a food trough. Yeah. Um, and so there are some foods down in there, if that helps. So let's put that into context. The food is down there. So sore neck, someone says, unable to put their head down. Yeah, very good. So I'll play her one more time. So the things that you should be seeing, again, she does have a little bit harder eye. Her ears are that airplane, right? So even though they're moving around, they keep continually ending up more of this uh, back and caudal. This other little behavior that you're seeing in there, that little bit of head toss, um, that is actually an abnormal behavior. Um, you can see that she is kind of wanting to get to that food, but a little reluctant to do that. So whoever said neck is sore, that's the winner. Hmm. So um, any guesses as to what happened to this pony? Someone said from shots. Yeah, she was vaccinated. <laughs> um, and so like this was like the perfect opportunity then to get pain video. Uh, but again, these are these little things. And I had more video of her where she was off by herself in the pasture. And again, she would hold her head that below parallel. So some of those more subtle signs that we don't want people to miss. Okay, so good job. Good one on that little mare. Okay, so um, now we're gonna talk about some other behaviors um, and things that happen for horses that I think is really important to kind of put into um, context. So um, pain-induced aggression. So horses, you know, we kind of have that fight or flight mechanism, right? And, and typically most horses will flee. Um, remember that aggression is not a, a typical normal response in a horse. Okay. So in this scenario, like if we were perhaps, um, and yes, they're deworming him. So the horse is just unhappy right now. Uh, but let's say we're doing a vaccine. It is not unusual for a horse to strike out in response or doing some sort of aversive procedure to the horse that um, you will see kind of variations of striking, kicking, biting, um, rearing, all of those that we label as kind of horse misbehavior can actually be um, due to pain. Um, so, it is really important to put that into context because for one, uh, we certainly don't want ourselves to be harmed, right? So we can be the recipient of this and it can be pretty, pretty bad on our end. We don't want horses to couple things that humans are doing with pain because then that can essentially be set up for a very learned response um, and can create a cycle of behavior that we're not really looking for. So the other one that, again, I kind of alluded to before is a lot of 
things that horses do while we're riding them, rearing, bucking, striking, people tend to put in this category of the horses misbehaving when ultimately they can really be pain induced. And, and I don't have time to go through all of the, the ridden horse piece. Um, so I actually have a separate section on um, specific things that you might see in the ridden horse um, for pain. So this is sort of just kind of those localized things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times, again, people are going to say it's unwillingness, the horse doesn't want to go forward, but there may be a lot of other things underlying um, those issues. So one of the best examples I had is actually, you know, a lot of lesson horses, school horses are, have a lot of pain that we don't address. Um, and there was a particular school horse that we were using and he was a very unhappy dude. Um, had a lot of, a lot of pain should have been, well, that's neither here nor there, but, uh, so, <laughs> but during, um, a, a lesson in a class lesson, the horse actually would kick out when it would pass the instructor. Um, because this was a very, very unhappy horse. And again, all the discipline in the world would not change the underlying motivation of this horse being in pain right? That has to be addressed before we even worry about um, some of the other issues that are going on. Um, so the other one that people may not realize horses will also do is displacement of aggression. And so a horse in pain may, again, react towards other horses, other animals, or people um, with kind of these threat gestures, biting, etc. The horse is uncomfortable, he's painful, and so that is being um, redirected. So I always caution people, horses are not naturally aggressive, right? So that is not kind of their normal playbook. So oftentimes, if you're seeing some of those behaviors, you really need to think more about what is going on with the animal and not put all the blame on the horse. And so to look a little bit deeper. Um, so this picture, I think, is just kind of a fun one. Um, so <laughs> this one is, uh, I tried to set this up to get kind of an angry horse picture. And I think I did pretty good. Um, and so this is, obviously this was set up in a field where there were other horses around. And so this was a little bit more of her resource guarding over this bucket of feed. But if you are seeing kind of this behavior around feeding time, that actually can be a sign of gastric pain. So if you are seeing sort of what we would think about these resource guiding or threat gestures or things like that around feeding time, it may not always be just, I'm driving another horse away from this food, especially if that horse is by itself in an individual environment and you're offering food and you're seeing kind of these, um, again, what we kind of group as these agonistic behaviors that can be an indicator that that horse is coupling that meal feeding, concentrate feeding with pain. And so now you get these redirected signs of aggression. So very important to, again, think a little deeper and not just blame the horse uh, for what's going on. So uh, very important and why that happens is that a lot of these behaviors, right? So <clears throat> horses that are you know, when we think about a girthy horse that's pinning the ears and reaching back to bite you or kicking or um, rears after being saddled or even things that, you know, I just think of example, like horses that don't want to enter, uh, uh, enter the arena anymore, or they're avoiding certain things. Those horses really learn pain and horses are good at learning pain um, and coupling those memories with other things. It's in their best interest to do that because they certainly from a survival standpoint, need to learn to avoid pain. But that can happen. And then the horse can develop some learned responses. Perhaps even after we've addressed the pain, it may take a while for that to go away of those learned experiences about pain. Um, and so that's why it's so critical to kind of identify these early versus um, kind of waiting a little bit too long. Why that's important. Um, in the horse world, we, we know that people often respond to some of these, you know, unwanted behaviors, the, the kickouts, the 
you know, looking back at their flanks or, or looking at you while they're saddling them, et cetera, with our act of aggression or increase in intensity. And so what you can end up is the cycle of paired pain with a human response that can essentially continue this cycle. Um, and so it's really important to try to break that cycle and not automatically respond to some of these adverse behaviors from a horse with saying, no, you shouldn't do that, or we'll just teach you not to, right? Because that's not going to change the under underlying motivation for what's actually going on there. Some other behaviors that I think are important to recognize, these sometimes get missed by people. Um, all of these behaviors can be normal, okay? So um, the behaviors I have listed here, and there are more behaviors, all of these can be normal at times. And so it's important to pay attention to the context. Um, how frequently are you observing these behaviors? Um, and to put the entire horse into the picture. So if I see some of these behaviors with some weight shifts or change in alertness or something like that, um, that can actually be an, an indicator of pain. And so one that we really need to pay attention to. So um, this little horse here, this is one that I think people miss um, is yawning behavior. Um, yawning can happen with um, uh, stress behaviors, right? So kind of, I think we see a lot of that with a horse post stress, but yawning repeatedly again, and if we're taking things into context with everything else we see, that's not normal for a horse to just repeatedly yawn. So um, in context, you see a horse that's repeatedly doing that behavior, that's time to go investigate. So a normal behavior can be absolutely nothing, or if seen repetitively in other situations like this horse here, that's an indicator of pain. Okay, let me get my next pony. Um, and then this one is one, you know, phlegm and response. We all think about that as pretty normal. Horse uh, smells a novel odor, stallion investigating, urine in a mare. Um, so it also can be pain. So again, these are more, take some skill to put it together because you may think, well, heck, that's just the phlegm and response. But this horse is resting weight. He's shifting um, his way back and forth, he's doing some chewing behavior. So there's a yawn. And so, okay, there's the phlegm response. All of that put to context, even though we don't have a horse that's thrashing on the ground, that is an uncomfortable animal. So hopefully that makes sense. You're looking for those things that kind of um, really stand out at you that they should not actually be there. So, um, I'm going to actually kind of jump now to a request uh, for the, the audience. Hopefully Dr. Williams doesn't mind that we do that. So part this is a little piece of this project that we're doing with um, creating this educational material about recognizing affective states in horses. So we actually have an opportunity if people are interested in participating. We've actually um, had the curriculum go through um, a pilot. And so now we're off into a larger phase of our research project. So this is actually what's in um, this material. So we talk about the importance of affective state. I'll really go through communication and the language of the horse with kind of a fine tooth comb and then try to put that all together. Um, also kind of just do some, a, a little bit brief around the senses and how they're unique to the horse and how in context that is a part of their well being. Um, and then we have another module on identifying abnormal states, and then we put it together into um, assessing management, both the horses and individual horses with other horses and the horse human piece. Um, and that is also where we have another section on pain in the ridden horse. So we take some of these things and then also look at it in its unique perspective um, in the ridden animal. So if anybody is interested um, to do or partake in kind of this study, um, essentially, you would have to do a pre-survey where we get information on your demographics. We ask you to do some assessment of affective state um, and then do some ranking statements of your level of agreement. The course itself is $30. It's 60-day access. 
And then afterwards, you also have to do a post survey so that we essentially are looking for your change in perception um, and change in how you um, are kind of thinking about things. Um, and then we also have a 90 day follow up um, to look at behavior change. So um, and that would be 90 days after that. If you enroll in the course and do all the surveys, including the 90 day follow up, um, then you'll be enrolled to receive a $30 gift card, which essentially then makes the course free. Um, so there's a lot of material. It's actually pretty fun. Um, it's pretty interactive um, and has a lot of videos that I just use a little bit. Uh, we have a lot more of our original videos in this course and really dive into the mental state of the horse and how we can better read their emotions and manage them a bit better. So with that, I will do any questions that you awesome. may have. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Heine. I really appreciate that. Um, if you can let me share my screen really quick before I open it up to questions, I'm gonna do one uh, quick thing, which is also give everybody a QR code and tell everybody that I would love to hear your feedback on the program tonight. If this is your third webinar, you can take the evaluation three times. You'll just select the correct date and you'll give me your feedback. You don't have to put in the survey what you want to hear in the future again, because we've kind of already gone through that. But Again, we really, really want to hear what you thought of the seminars, and we want to know what you want to hear in the future. So please go ahead and do that. Kyle's also going to drop a link into the chat. So I just also wanted to give you the opportunity to click on a QR code. I know a few of you have found that to be easier um, as well. So um, with that being said, I'm only going to share that quickly. And now we're going to get to questions, because I know we're running out of time, but you have a lot of great questions. So I think some of them, and I might try to lump them because we're getting so many, I know we're going to run out of time. Um, but is there a kind of a quick and dirty way to figure out what is really pain versus what is anxiety, stress, um, behavioral, things like that? I mean, other than obviously work, the obvious one working with your vet, um, but is there an easy answer to that? I don't think there is. And the reason, because a lot of stress, anxiety, frustration may be pain related, right? So those are very hard to tease apart. Why is that horse anxious about going to the horse show? Does he have an ulcer or do you riding him? Is it past his capacity and it hurts? So I would default, and this is my little two cents. If I have stress, anxiety, frustration in a horse, I'm going to default first to, is there an underlying cause of pain? I better sure rule that out before I'm going to think about anything else or behavior modification or, or, or that, because you can't change behavior, right? I cannot get rid of anxiety, frustration, and ors if the pain is still there. So I would say default to looking critically mm -hmm. about does this horse have some, and again, in the ridden horse piece, there's some other parts that you would look for in, in ridden horse pain, uh, but I would always default it, right? So certainly there's some like separation anxiety. Those are the classic ones that, you know, we're separated from another one. Yeah, that's probably not pain. Um, so a little bit of a zip context, but boy, if I'm thinking about ridden, um, unless he just doesn't like to be isolated, I'm going to be worried a little bit more about what pain is there. Mm -hmm. So kind of along those same lines, but just the opposite. You mentioned a lot about licking and chewing and chewing being pain related. Um, but a couple of them said, I always thought that was a sign of relaxation. Can you explain the difference? Yeah, so that, that's a good one. So it's kind of fun, right? So this is uh, the difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic control. Um, and so when we, when it's classically been talked about as relaxation, what everybody is forgetting is there was stress right? That horse was under sympathetic control, right? So that's a different part of the nervous system. And so you're really, it's, it's which part of the autonomic nervous system is in control. So that lip licking and chewing, right? Means the horse was stressed. So, and I've seen it where they do that in response to stress and there's no relaxation in that animal whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that one, I think has almost become a mythology about like, oh, if you see that, it's good. Mm, you might want to take a step back and really look at it in, in context. So uh, a one that's 
I think, been put into the knowledge bank, but maybe coded incorrectly. Very good point. Um, so I, I know you, you didn't focus on writing, but there is a question, and I don't know if you can answer this quickly or not, or say stay tuned, maybe I'll have you do your writing talk next year. Um, uh, what is your thoughts on uh, Sue Dyson's 24 behaviors on the ridden horse? Yeah, so that's a lot of what we go back through um, is uh, some of her work. Uh, so Sue Dyson's ridden horse pain ethogram. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do uh, cite her work and have some of her videos in there. Um, now she is, she's like a lameness expert, right? So if we know Sue Dyson, like she's a lameness guru. Her eye and ability to see things is incredible, right? Um, but I think those are those are great. And so the idea of the the twenty four behaviors in the in the ridden horse ethogram, what well, we have to remember it's context and and do you see them? What is the frequency? So again, it, it, do you see it all the time? Is it only in certain contexts? Do you see it consistently? And do you see just one behavior or do you see multiple behaviors? If you see multiple behaviors, right, and occurring frequently, it's a pretty good indicator of pain. So yeah, I actually think that's a great um, resource for people to to look at. Yeah, and and we do so that of this little course, like there's two sections on it in pain, but a lot of it is also just where are you seeing frustration, resistance, what is truly relaxation, and trying to put that all um, together. Awesome, sounds like a great course. Um, I, let's do two more quick questions to wrap it up. Um, hopefully quick anyway. Um, flaming and yawning, can that indicate colic? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a quick one. Um, <laughs> then, uh, okay. This is, this is a good one. And I don't know if there's an answer to this. Um, how do you convince your vet that is out there for an issue and when they're come out, they feel like you're overreacting? but you know there's signs in your horse that are indicating something's wrong, but they just don't see it. Oh, that's a oh, okay. million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Um, oh, okay, so I'm gonna maybe put my other hat on for a second here. Um, so I do dogs, right? Everybody that knows me that does dogs. My dogs, um, when there's something wrong with them, go to their agility vet, like literally a vet that does agility. And so some of these subtle things, like if it's performance horses, you might need somebody that's familiar, that does a lot of those type of horses that are able to see some of these more subtle things. Like I said, Dr. Dyson is, she can see so much that maybe you're you know, if you think about your GP, horse vet may not pick up. And I would also say to empower yourself to be an advocate, right? Because you see that animal every day. Um, and so you may be much better at picking up those subtle things, right? Because here's the thing. If you're a GP vet, you're generally coming out to see, ah, he's rolling like... <laughs> You know, it's going, it's going south, right? Versus veterinarians that are dealing more with these little subtlety things. So I think it's about the right veterinarian for the right situation. And I don't think any in the veterinary community would disagree with that, right? We have specialists and there are people that specifically deal with um, certain things. Um, and again, people that deal with your type of horse may be more familiar you know, I'm thinking riding discipline, not like breed, but like they may be more familiar with kind of some of these subtle things that may be happening. I awesome. That makes sense. Well, with that, I think that was great. Um, I see a lot of comments saying that was wonderful. They really want you to do your uh, riding horse pain next year. So um, yeah, we'll be in touch. <laughs> um, but thank you guys very much. I'm going to share my screen one more time and ask everybody to please either go to the link or go to the QR code, fill out the evaluation for the tonight. Let us know what you thought about the presenters. Again, if you've done it, the last two webinars, this is a different webinar and a different, uh, it's the same set of questions, but um, just we'll fo focus on today. So I really would need you to fill out all three days. If you didn't do it for the last few days, please go back and do it for the last few days. 
um, because I really like your feedback on the surveys and tell us what you want to hear next year. Um, That's exactly how I got all of these really fun topics this year. That's also how I got our live horse management seminar topics. So, um, yeah, please, uh, I, uh, you know, we would always just do nutrition and fun topics that I like um, if I didn't know what all of my clientele wanted. So please, please let me know what you want to hear. And with that being said, uh, thank my speakers again for uh, donating your time this evening. And thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your week.